Okay, we're now building up the intuition that we're going to need to understand Fourier. So we're going to put on a different pair of glasses and look at signals through a frequency lens instead of a time domain lens. So what it means is we're going to see what are all the frequencies that make up our signal at this moment. In order to do that, we have to understand a couple fundamental operations. And one of them is called the dot product. And we, we've gone over this in class, but I just want to make sure that it's 100% crystal clear. So let me talk about it again. And, and this is the foundation of, of our whole Fourier process. So a dot product is something we can define on two arrays. So, so the dot product on two arrays, y1 of x and y2 of x is defined as the sum of element wise products. So we say y1 0 times y2 0 plus y1 1 times y2 1 plus y1 2 times y2 2 all the way up to y1 n minus 1 times y2 n minus 1. Okay. So we can say, in other words, it's the sum of element-wise products in between two parallel arrays. Okay. Now this way of writing it is a bit cumbersome, so you can also write it mathematically using sigma, sigma notation. You can say, um, and the notation is y1 dot y2. Um, is equal to the sum from we'll say x equals zero, so we're zero indexed up to m minus one of y one x times y two x. Okay, so that's another way to write it. Now I find that computer science students like to see code, and you can, you really can just define the stuff in code too. So, so let's let's see how you would do it the Python way. So what I can say is I need an accumulator variable that's going to accumulate these element-wise products. I'll call it dot prod. Starts off at zero. So I'll say for i in range length of y1. So I'm assuming y length of y1 is equal to length of y2. So now I can say dot product plus equals y1 at index i times y2 at index i. So that's, that's what you're doing. Okay, but there's actually an even faster way to do it in NumPy because that avoids loops because NumPy has a lot of nice element-wise operations between arrays like we've seen. So for NumPy, all it is is dot prod equals np dot sum y1 times y2. Boom. So the y1 times y2 creates a new array. Assuming that y1 and y2 have the same length. This is going to create a new NumPy array in which each element is the product of corresponding elements of y1 and y2. And the sum is going to sum up all the elements in that new array and give me a single number. Okay. So the dot product of two arrays actually gives me a single number, sometimes called a scalar. Okay. So, so just, just a one numerical value. Now this can be defined, this is defined for any arrays y1 and y2, but when we start to focus on arrays that hold samples of pure cosines and pure sines that go through an integer number of periods on an interval, we see something very interesting. So for example, if I take a cosine that goes through three cycles on an interval and another cosine that goes through four cycles on an interval, let's look and you know I take a hundred samples of each, so my arrays have um, samples of each one of these. Let's see what we get with the dot product. Okay, so here's the first one again. So here I'm just visualizing the elements of the array, um, 100 elements. So there's the one that goes through three cycles of a cosine. Here's the one that goes through four cycles. And I need to do the element-wise products and sum them up. Before I sum them, let me just look at the element-wise products. So, so here is each one. And I can see that if I go to sum these, well, they're, all the positives are gonna get canceled out by negatives here. So this ends up being a very, very tiny number numerically, which is zero. Okay. Um, but if I make them the same, then 
what I see is actually the element wise products are always going to be positive because anyone that's negative, well, I multiply it by itself. A negative times a negative is a positive. So that becomes positive. So if I put, if the two arrays actually hold the same thing, then their dot product will be non-zero. It'll be, it'll be strictly, um, well, assuming that the whole arrays aren't zero, then the dot product that you get will be, will be positive. Okay. So this leads to our first rule. So rule number one. So given um, two arrays, y1 and y2, um, so, so two things. If y1, oh yeah, and I should say two arrays, y1 and y2, each of which holds samples of, I should also say they're both length n, each of which holds samples of um, a pure sine or a pure cosine um, that goes through an integer number of periods, then two things. So one, if y1 is equal to y2, then um, y1 dot y2 is greater than zero. Okay. Um, yeah, and I should say to make this strictly true, each of which holds samples of pure sine or pure cosine that goes through an integer number of periods greater than zero. Okay, so, so it should, needs to go through at least one period. Um, okay, if y1 equals y2, then y, y1 dot y2 is greater than zero, right? So, so that, that's where you get this positive thing. Otherwise, y1 dot y2 is equal to zero. So that's rule number one. So this is kind of neat because if we don't know what y2 is, we can figure it out by taking this dot product with a bunch of different things and seeing which one gives us a dot product greater than zero. So I'm gonna give you some, some intuition about why this is true. I mean, we can kind of see it visually here. I think, I think it's fairly clear that why, if you take the dot product of something with itself, why you end up with a positive. It's maybe a little bit less clear why if you take a dot product with something that's different, um, why you would always end up with zero or numerically zero, right? This is a very tiny number. Or why, you know, even if they're the same frequency, but one of them is a sine or, and the other one is a cosine, why you would end up with, with a zero as well. So I want to um, jump back to our calculus for a second, and I want to look at a similar problem um, that uses integrals. So let's suppose um, we want to do evaluate the integral. So the integral from zero to one of cosine two pi f one t times cosine two pi f two t dt. And we'll say um, f one and f2 are both integers greater than zero. Okay. Um, okay, so I want to evaluate this definite integral here. And this is very similar to dot product. So I have one, instead of an array, I have a function and another function. Um, I'm taking their products at different times. And then I'm summing them all up. That's what an integral is, right? It's just taking a sum. So th this is a very similar thing. And I'm saying f1 and f2 are both integers. So that means that this, these must go through an integer number of cycles over the unit interval here. OK. So I just set up an integral, which is very similar to, to the dot product. It really, actually, it is a dot product, um, but in an infinite dimensional space. OK. But, but this, this is, I, I can appeal to some of your prior knowledge to show, to kind of explain this rule a little bit. Um, so let's, let's look at and try to evaluate this integral. Um, so I have to remember that there's a rule that's going to help me here, which, which is a trig identity. So the trig identity, um, so recall that cosine of A times cosine of B um, 
is equal to cosine of a minus b plus cosine of a plus b, um, actually over 2. OK. So here's a trig identity that will come in handy. Let me make that a little bigger so we can see it nice. OK. Um, all right. So I'm just going to rewrite this integral then. Um, and by using this identity. So, so what I'll say is, OK, this is an integral of, of the product of two cosines. Um, what I should get in the end is actually should be, um, if you look at this and apply this formula, should be cosine of f1 minus f2 t um, plus cosine of f1 plus f2t. Okay, so if the product, I don't really know what to do with that, but, but let me just split it up into a sum of cosines. Okay, let's see what I get here. Okay, so I'm saying this is the integral I get. It's a little nasty with those parentheses, but, but basically it's just the integral of one half of cosine of 2 pi times the difference between the frequencies plus cosine of 2, uh, whoops, I meant to say the sum of the two frequencies there. Oh, crap, I messed the whole thing up, didn't I? What did I do? <laughs> um, okay, there we go. All right, so here's the product of two cosines. Here's what it turns into. By the way, this, this trig identity is another way of looking at beat frequencies. Uh, we're kind of reverse engineering the beat frequency. Um, so some of this should look kind of familiar. This, this, like you can think of A as the B frequency and B as the carrier frequency. Um, and, then, and then you start to see some of this stuff. So you can see, see in there that the B frequency is actually um, the difference between the carrier and the, and, or difference between two frequencies. Okay, anyway, but, but okay, sorry, I got, got off on a sidetrack there. But, but let's just examine this for a moment. So let me, let me appeal to my um, fundamental theorem of calculus and take the antiderivative of both of these. So if I do that, um, what I'll get, okay, so the antiderivative of cosine is sine. I have to use the chain rule, so I'm um, gonna have to bring out some factors here. But, but what this should turn into is, sorry, one second, gotta get my math set up nice here. Probably be easier on a whiteboard, but this is what we're stuck with for now. All right, so, so we're going to have one half times. Um, okay, so, so we're going to apply the chain rule and the fact that the antiderivative of cosine is sine. So we're going to bring out this factor here. So we're just going to have one over two pi times f1 minus f2. So actually, when you get used to LaTeX, it's almost like coding with math. You, you can copy and paste a little math things that you reuse, which is nice. But okay, so we got that. And then we're going to be left with sine of, and I'm going to copy my thing, sine of that. Okay, this is only the first part. Let me just check to see what I have so far. Okay, so, so I applied my chain rule. Um, get sine of 2 pi f1. Minus f2 times t. Okay, now I need the other part, which is um, just f1 plus f2. And I want to evaluate this at um, 1 and 0. So I'm just applying my fundamental theorem of calculus here. Um, Okay, there we go. Uh, sorry, let me make this. Ah, <laughs> LaTeX is hard to get sometimes. Okay, it doesn't like that. Let me just go back to what I was doing. All right, so I have to evaluate this at one and I have to evaluate this at zero and I get the result. Now, if I look at this, well, okay, so evaluated at zero, sine of zero, zero. Okay, so that part is easy. Everything drops out. Actually, sine of 1 in this case. If I plug in 1 to t, well, f1 is an integer, f2 is an integer. This is going to be some integer times 2 pi, times 
times 1. So just some integer times 2 pi. Same thing here. f1 plus f2 is also an integer. So 2 pi times some integer. Well, sine of 2 pi times an integer is 0. That you're, you've gone a full revolution. You're back at 0 again. So sine of 0 is 0. Sine of any integer times 2 pi is 0. So this whole thing drops out. All right. So, so when, when um, f1 is not equal to f2, this whole expression, this whole definite integral evaluates to 0. So that's sort of how you end up seeing that um, if you have a cosine of two things that are different um, and you integrate them over some integer number of, of cycles, you integrate their, their products, that you get 0. So this is sort of a proof to show, to show why the dot product is 0. Um, you could show a similar thing if this is cosine and this is sine, or if, or if they're both sines. Very similar trig identities, so I'm not even going to go through the details. But, but those proofs hold. Now what's different, um, so, so I'll say, you know, I start off assuming that f1 and f2 are both integers greater than 0, and f1 um, is not equal to f2. But if I make them the same, then this changed a little bit because actually, if you look at the trig identity, um, so let's say we go back and we look at, um, so now examine, so we'll make them the same. So this turns into f, just f of t squared dt. Um, now, I guess this is more commonly written as cosine of cosine squared. That's the notation. But it's just, it's just the cosine of 2 pi of t times itself. Um, now, you can, you can manipulate this. So we're still assuming that this is an integer um, greater than 0. So you can manipulate uh, th this trig identity to see that, that actually this can be re rewritten as um, the integral from 0 to 1. Of um, cosine of so okay so if I look at this a and b are the same so this is cosine of zero so that drops out so so it'll be one that first term would be one plus cosine of two times two pi of t so cosine of four pi f t um, all over two what did I screw up here. Uh, I need to do that. Okay. Um, let's make this a little bigger so we can see it nice. Okay. So I just uh, used the same trig identity, but I was able to rewrite this um, as that. Now, what I can see is, is what I'm going to end up with here in the definite integral is, oops. Um, let me write this down here. Okay, so what I'm going to have is, okay, I can split this up into two parts, one half um, plus cosine of 4 pi of t over 2. So I'm going to have um, one half t, so t over 2. Um, plus, and I do the same kind of thing I did before, so 1 over 2 times 4 pi f, so 8 pi f times the sine of 4 pi f t, evaluated at 1 and subtracted from the evaluation at 0. So this is how I, how I do my definite integral. Okay, so let's look at that. Um, now here's what's interesting. So, so just the same way that, that before we, we argued that if, if this is an integer multiple of um, two pi, then we're gonna end up with zero. So, so this term actually drops out, but this one doesn't now. I'm left with something that doesn't drop out. So I actually end up with one half, which is interesting because I plug in one, I get one half, I plug in zero, I get zero. So, so this, this integral now evaluates to one half. Um, so maybe this now kind of explains why when we looked at these sums, 
we always got if, if we had um, a cosine two cosines that were the same number we always ended up with a sum which was one half of the total number of samples okay so, so maybe that's starting to to, to to make sense now all right so, so that's I just wanted to go through um, some stuff that you might have seen before okay so let me let, I'm gonna let that all sink in so just take a moment and then I want to talk about the last rule here.